This is an overview of the Tabernacle Lessons 1 through 4. Since we've been apart from our study for a while due to Passover and other things that have come into play, we thought it might be good to refresh your mind that you might have the first four lessons more updated and able to pick up in Lesson 5 next week. As we began, we noticed that the importance of the Tabernacle is shown to us in the amount of space Scripture gives to it. God used over 50 chapters to tell us about either the instruction of or the construction of the tabernacle and I don't believe there's anything else in scripture that he gave that much time to so we see that this was of ultimate importance in the mind of God therefore it should be to us also and I believe that reason is because of the very purpose of the tabernacle the purpose that we see comes from the name Mishkan. Mishkan means dwelling, and the tabernacle was to be a dwelling place for God among mankind. We find that in Shemot in Exodus 25.8, and we find again how God wants to tabernacle with his people in the end of our time also in the book of Revelation in chapter 21 and verse 3 in particular. In Exodus and Shemot, God says, make me a sanctuary so that I may live among them, meaning live among his people. And in Revelation, he starts off with behold, which we know means God saying, wake up, pay attention. Behold, God's Shekhinah is with mankind. They will be his people and he will be their God. And we see that was the purpose with the tabernacle and what God's intent has been with his creation of man ever since the very beginning. The tabernacle gives us a beautiful picture of redemption because we're going to see that Moshe was given the law and the law condemned. The law brought what separates us from our God and the tabernacle is the picture that provides salvation for us and shows us the way back into the presence of God. When Moshe had assembled the tabernacle, he anointed all of its components with sacred anointing oil. That was called Shemen Ha Mishcha. And Shemen is the word for oil. Ha Mishcha is anointed. And the word Mashiach comes from the same root as Mishcha. So we're seeing that Messiah, as we know, also means the anointed one. It, in this case, this would be then foreshadowing that God's plan of redemption was given in Mashiach, in his anointed one. We're going to see that Moses, Moshe, built the tabernacle after the pattern that he was shown. There is a heavenly tabernacle. It is the original, and the one that we have on earth was patterned after everything that Moshe saw, that he was given instruction to follow and build it according to what he had seen. Again, we read of this in Shemot chapter 25, and Hebrews 9 also speaks to us about it being patterned after the heavenly. The interesting thing about this pattern of the tabernacle, remembering that it is uh, showing us, foreshadowing for us God's plan of redemption, the pattern then was given to Moshe in the form of a cross. As we look at all the furniture or the components of the tabernacle, we're going to see that as they were laid out, it was in the shape of a cross. Now when scripture tells us about it, it talks about it from the top, the in, and brings us out. The end, the top is the Holy of Holies, the most holy place where the Shekhinah glory of God dwelt and the anointed one, Mashiach, came from the presence of the Holy God, comes to earth, comes to reach mankind and he reaches us or he, the way, the place that we begin is at that point of redemption at the sacrifice, at the shed blood and that's the foot of the cross which is the brazen altar so we see when we're looking at it from God's perspective, he's looking through from the Holy of Holies from his place and looking outward. But when we study it, we go from out to in because the only way to into the presence of Elohim is by way of the cross. So we start at the brazen altar and we work our way in through the shed blood to be able to come into the Holy of Holies to the Shekinah glory, the presence of our holy God. There are many colors used in our tabernacle. It, it is an array. It's not made in the, the, to look like a rainbow, but it has all the colors of the rainbow in it. And the colors are very meaningful. The only color I have to say may be left out. I don't remember anything green. I think the closest we get to green is the acacia tree 
the wood is what is used, but the tree would have green in it. The leaves would be green, but the leaves were not used in the building of the tabernacle, so that's really stretching it. But just as a quick reminder, when we see the colors, and we'll see the colors several different times within the tabernacle itself, we see it from the curtain at the gateway to go in. We see it from the curtain going into the building that we were about ready to look at. Uh, when we, are, we will look at it when we start. We'll call it Lesson 5. This is like a, an interruption. And we'll see that the colors are <clears throat> over that building also. When we see blue, it reminds us of heavens. The heavenly color, and that reminds us of the deity of Yeshua Jesus, that he came from heaven, but took on human form also. He was fully man. It reminds us of Yochanan, John chapter 1 and verse 1. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. And when we drop down to verse 14, we find that the Word dwelt among man. And when it says dwelt among man, it actually says tabernacled among man. So blue is reminding us of that heavenly color that goes right along with purple. Purple speaking of the royalty. We have the king of Israel who is the one that we are looking to as we see this picture of redemption. And he is called the king of Israel in Mattathiah, Matthew chapter 2 and verse 2. When the wise men came from the east following his star and asked of the, the king of Herod at the time, where is he who was born king of the Jews? We see the scarlet or the red color it reminds us of sacrifice, of blood that was shed. And we know that that's a picture to us of the cross where he shed his blood for us. According to Romans, according to Hebrews and many other places, he shed his blood to spare us from the condemnation of the law, to bring us the, the victory over the wage of sin, which is death. And he, uh, by his perfect shed blood, would justify many. Yeshaya, Isaiah 53, 11 speaks to that also, but there are many scriptures that speak to the fact that we are able to escape the, the condemnation, the punishment, the guilt of our sins through the cross. In the that shedding of blood, we come to have our sins washed as white as snow, according to uh, Yeshaya, Isaiah, our prophet, chapter 1, and verse 18. Come, let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they'll be white as snow. And then it repeats it with some other words. So we see white in our linen also, uh, the linen um, cloths, and we'll know that that's representing to us the purity or even the righteousness that is given to us because when the white linen is being worn, and we'll go into the high priest's uh, garments at the very end of the study, when the white, white linen is worn is also the righteousness of God that is placed on us through the shed blood of Yeshua Jesus. So our colors have meaning and our materials have meaning. Gold was used, literally gold. And again, gold speaks of deity, that all the way through scripture we see that. Silver speaks of redemption, it was the atonement money. Bronze speaks to us of judgment. And then the shatim or the acacia wood speaks to us of the hu humanity or humility of the Lord. Now, as we go on, because again, it's just an overview, we'll look around our tabernacle real quickly. And as we look around our tabernacle, we see again a form of a cross. And what we're looking at is where the tribes were <laughs> parked. I can't think of another word right now. Uh, but three tribes were on each side, north, south, east, and west, and they formed a cross. The Levitical tribe was in the middle. You can kind of see it in that picture. It went all the way around the tabernacle. They, they were split up on all four sides. And if you wonder how they got 12 tribes, well, Ephraim, Ephraim, and Manasseh, Manasseh, both were counted as tribes, and that brought the number back up to 12. Uh, looking now at our next slide, we see the court. And the court, I'm just going to remind you quickly, was 75 feet wide, 150 feet long, and 8 feet high. So it was a large court, but the important thing about it was that height. The curtains that went all the way around separated the inside from the out. When you were outside, you could not see in and see what was going on, and you couldn't just climb over. You had to come through the gate or through the doorway that we'll talk about in a moment. But uh, when you're on the inside, you also are shut out from everything of the world and everything that would distract you and you would be focusing on the real purpose of why you are there. It also reminds us that we have to go through that door. 
uh, that man is separated from God's holiness. There has to be a way to come back into his holiness, and that's what the tabernacle was all about. So let's look at the gate, and let's go in through that gate. You cannot see it well here, but the gate is a curtain with many of those colors in it that we spoke of before. It's the first of three entrances all the way in till we get to the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle. We see in that a significance because when Yeshua spoke of himself in Yochanan, John, he, he recorded the words, chapter 14 and verse 6, and he recorded, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes unto the Father but by me. Well, we know when we get to the Holy of Holies, we're in the presence of the Father. We're in the, the Shekhinah glory of God, which is also the express image of Yeshua, Jesus himself. But there is a way to come in, and as Yeshua said, he is the only way. So the first entrance we're looking at as the way. And uh, the way, only way through as we come into that entrance, and we're, we won't go there quite yet, but as we do, we're going to see that we immediately come to the altar where the sacrifice is made. That, in essence, is the foot of the cross, as I have been speaking about. And it is at that point that we can come into the presence of the Father. Uh, we've gone a little ahead uh, just before we get there. Let me tell you that the curtain is 30 feet wide. That's wide enough for all to come. And that reminds us of John's words again, Yohanan, recorded in chapter 3 and verse 16, where God said he so loved the world. It's open and wide enough for all to come in because it was not exclusive for anyone. Uh, the Jewish people, the ones who God gave the tabernacle to, they weren't even known as a Jewish race at this point in time. But those who wanted to come into the presence of God simply came in through the laws and through the, the commonwealth of Israel that God was laying down for the Jewish people at this time. Okay, now we'll go in. And as we mentioned, once we come through that gate, we come immediately to the brazen altar. And the brazen altar, there it is, is square in shape. It's equal opportunity for all. We see four corners. We see four directions. There's another uh, shot that you'll see in a few moments that will show those four corners just a tad bit better, but this is good enough for right now. We want to point out that if we look north, east, west, or south, it is for all to come because any could come from any direction and grab the horns of the altar for safety and protection to be judged whether they had, uh, if they had killed someone by accident or on purpose, they could not be put to death until judgment had been given. So it was a place to come for safety and to come into uh, a, where they could be released from the condemnation that they would be under. Why did I give it north, east, west, and south? Because if you take those four letters, N-E-W-S, you have news. And this is good news that it is uh, God's redemption available to all. This is the place of sacrifice, and the sacrifice is what makes us justified. Justified is just as if I never sinned. It's declaring one's righteousness through the shed blood of Yeshua. And of course, at this point, it was the animal that was substituted rather than the death of the one coming. It would be the death of the animal, and the animal's blood being shed in place of the person, and then the priest would take the blood and go further for the person. So uh, as we look at our next uh, picture of the uh, brazen altar, we see in it also that it was made of acacia wood that was overlaid with bronze, and that's reminding us of the humanity that Yeshua had to take on human form to rescue humans, and the bronze or the brass is the judgment of God that he took the judgment for us. The horns also are a symbol of power to save, the power of um, protecting from the penalty of sin and the place of refuge as I described it. Now what's very interesting about the mercy seat also is the height, I'm sorry, I gave it away. <laughs> what's interesting also about the brazen altar is the height of it was the height of the mercy seat. So as, as much as God's judgment has to be there and he has to judge sin, he cannot just ignore it, at the same time, we are being shown that his mercy is just as great. Those horns would be tipped with blood, the blood of the atonement in the eyes of God for anyone and for everyone, again, all directions. And the ashes that would be collected would be taken to a clean place outside the camp, reminding us that Yeshua went outside the camp to die for us, was laid in a new, fresh, clean tomb, 
outside the camp and the fact that we see staves that this is a movable piece of furniture is to remind us that God's atonement can reach us anywhere, anytime, anywhere on life's journey. So it's giving us a picture of, uh, it doesn't matter where you are, what age, what time you were born, whether you were born in, in pre-Yeshua's day, in his day, or in 2020 today. It's still available atonement for all mankind at all times that they might have the mercy of God in their lives. So remember when we look at this, we have to stop and think because Hebrews especially lays out for us that Yeshua is our high priest. Hebrews, the book means better. Everything in it is better, better, better. And when it talks about the priesthood, it talks about the better priesthood than the earthly uh, priesthood that we saw from the Levitical family. And we see Yeshua, Jesus represented as our high priest, taking his blood from the, the altar where it was shed taking it to the mercy seat in heaven and putting it in the presence of God that he might atone once and for all for the sins of every sinner, all time, all through the ages, all able to be forgiven because his sinless blood was able to be applied to any and to all. Uh, that was the big difference. What made it better is it was sinless and it would be atonement for all, not for one, not for a, a family, not for a nation, not for a certain day or a certain period of time, but it would be for everyone for all time. And uh, we see that Yeshua took his blood, as I mentioned earlier, and placed it on the mercy seat in heaven. How do we get that? A quick study through the, uh, the time of resurrection. We just had our Sunday time when uh, many remember and uh, celebrate the resurrection of Yeshua Jesus and if they went through some of uh, the activities that happened at that time you may have also and if so your mind may be right up on some of what I'll say if not let me refresh your mind Miriam or Mary as you call her was one of the first uh, that was at the tomb uh, in her tears was crying uh, thought that the body had been taken thought that she was talking with the gardener until that gardener spoke to her by name, called her by name, and I think even just in the voice, she realized that she was in the presence of the one that she loved. In her reaction, which any of us would do if you just grieved the loss of someone for three days and you suddenly find out that he is alive and well, she wanted to wrap her arms around him, she wanted to cling to him, and he told her not to cling to him, that he had not yet ascended to his father and to her father, and then he told her to go and tell the Talmudim that he would meet them in Galilee. Well, a little bit later, we see another group of women who meet Yeshua Jesus also, not much later, and they are allowed to cling to him. They're allowed to touch him. They're allowed to, in essence, fall at his feet and worship him because that's what we read that they did in Matthew, Matthew's recordings of the words, uh, I'm sorry, recordings of the actions of Messiah. Uh, Matthew 28, if you want to look it up later for yourself, is where they climbed to his feet and they worshipped him and the fact that he had resurrected. Well, we realized something had to have taken place between the first and the second part. And if we go back into the book of Hebrews again, we begin to get an inkling of what took place. In Hebrews chapter 4, it refers to our Yeshua as our great high priest, the Kohen Gadol, the great high priest, who passed through the heavens. And Hebrews 6 tells us a little bit more and calls it the anchor of our soul. This one who entered through the veil where Yeshua was a forerunner as a high priest for us. Now it finishes off and tells us in chapter 10 of Hebrews that uh, we have this confidence that we can go into the holy place by the blood of Yeshua and that it is a new and a living way. I'm going to pause right there and bring to you what I believe we are being told. That there was a time when Yeshua took his blood, took it from this earth, put it on the mercy seat in heaven. That's when he went through the veil, placed it there to purchase redemption for us in the very presence of God so that we now could go into the presence of God when we leave this earth. We could be at home with the Lord as we're told in scripture that we are. And that is the anchor of our soul, and that could only be done by this one who was our great high priest. 
and I believe that's what we are being seen, being shown by the difference between when he said don't touch me and when he allowed them to touch him was he had placed that blood there and then he had come back to continue on uh, for a, a short time before he ascended and stayed permanently in heaven. But notice Hebrews also called it, said that we can go into this holy place through a new way, through a living way. And remember, Yochanan John 14 tells us that Yeshua said, I am the way. And he was telling us he was the way to the Father. So I believe that it's showing us very clearly the new way is through Yeshua. It's a living way because Yeshua is alive. He is resurrected. When you go and see the tomb where they believe he was laid in Israel, there uh, used to be just recently, it's been removed, but there was a door over the, the tomb area. Um, the door was not part of the tomb in Yeshua's day but it had been added there that had a saying on it from scripture that said he is not here he is risen it was always exciting to see that because it was an empty tomb and you sense that that you're not looking at a place of death but you're looking at a place of resurrected life and this is the new and the living way and it's been inaugurated for us by the one who's gone through the veil through the parachet through the veil, and, and Hebrews also says that is his flesh. It was as if his flesh opened the way, his, his death opened the way, and we know that veil from the top to the bottom was rent in two when he died on the cross, and uh, it was wider than a man's hand, it was so tall, the only way that could have been divided the way it was was by the hand of God, splitting it open, why? Because we're going to see that that, was, that veil was hiding the presence of God, and it was a tangible way to show that now the way had been opened right into the presence of God. Nothing to separate anymore. This high priest has made us fully clean so that we can have assurance of our faith. And that is the beauty of the picture from the altar to the Holy of Holies. Remember the altar was at the foot and the mercy seat is at the top. Blood shed and blood placed makes the way. With that in mind, we are going to come back and look at our other uh, components also because again and again we will see this picture of redemption that is so beautiful to us and so important to God that he spent a lot of time in it with us. And we've come to the laver. The laver was a place of washing. It was uh, water in a bronze looks like a big bowl. Yeah. <laughs> there are many artistic renditions of what the labor looked like. We don't know exactly. You can look in scripture and then look at the pictures and decide what you like best for yourself. I just try to pick pictures that give us the best understanding of what was going on. The labor was for the cleansing according to need and there was no measurement given because we need daily cleansing. Cleansing is sanctification. Sanctified is being set apart from the sin but also being set unto God. That we're set apart for a purpose unto God and to serve God. And the first step was the cross. The cross brings that cleansing. We're washed in his blood. The next uh, picture of the labor shows a little bit more clearly that there was, in their mind, two places of the water, one for the hands and one for the feet. Now, there are other pictures that will show you just water in the cup part and like a little bowl that they would take the water out and wash the feet. Which way is accurate? We'll find out one day when we see the real in heaven. But the purpose behind it is showing that the hands had to be washed and ready for service. They had to be clean and pure hands and the feet would represent uh, that, uh, what would I say, our walk with the Lord. I think it's the best way to put it. To have daily fellowship with the Lord, we need to be cleansed daily. The priests were always cleansed before they went into communion with Elohim and we know that uh, Yochanan in one of his little books in the back of our Bibles toward the end tells us that if we confess our sins daily that he forgives us and cleanses us from all unrighteousness. Does this mean that we're needing to ask over and over and over for forgiveness of sin? No, it's that daily communication with him that we can break by our disobedience, by our not being in compliance with his rules and his ways because the law is never done away with. It's just the condemnation that's done away with for us. And while we're totally forgiven 
forever for past, present, and future sins, we still want that fellowship with him that gets broken when we allow sin to enter in and come between us. And through that daily cleansing, through that daily washing, we, we bring that relationship back into a good and a healthy place where we can hear his voice, follow his ways, become more like him. And we're told throughout scripture that the, the scripture is the, the washing and the renewing of our minds, of our hearts. Uh, Hezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 36, that God will sprinkle you with water and you'll be clean. Psalm Tehillim 51 refers to the washing of the word. Yeshia, Isaiah also in chapter 1 refers to many, many places where we see that the word of God, the blood of Yeshua, washes and cleanses us and brings us into that right fellowship with the Lord. When we've been cleansed and we're ready and we are into that right relationship, we're ready to go into that next part, that next component in our tabernacle. What we are ready for is that building. That building should have been an intrigue and interest to our people, as I hope it is to us as we study. When we look at the outside, we cannot tell, but on the inside there are two different uh, um, parts, two different comp compartments, shall I say, that make up the one building. The first place is called the holy place, and it was 30 feet long, 15 feet wide, and 15 feet high. The second part connected with it, all under the curtains that you're seeing covering it, is the holy of holies, the most holy place where the Shekhinah glory of God rested, and it was a cube, 15 feet by 15 feet by 15 feet, reminding us of the new Yerushalayim, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven. It's the presence of God. It is his eternal home. We are told that it, well, it's our eternal home, excuse me, where the presence of God and the Lamb are, and that the Lamb is the light of it, that there's no need for a sun. There's no night there because of the, the light of the sun. So the Holy of Holies is a beautiful picture to remind us of our future home also, as well as dwelling in that presence of our Holy God. The materials to make this building were made again of acacia wood, speaking again of the humanity of our Lord and his humility, but it was also covered with gold, speaking of his deity. Um, as we look at this building, we know that the building itself again was another picture for us of Messiah. Ephesians, written by, or given to us, uh, recorded for us, uh, it was Shaul Paul's words written to a group of Messianic believers and others who had come into believing also that lived in a, a place called Ephesus. And he wrote to them in chapter 2, verse 20, he said, You have been built on the foundation of the emissaries of the apostles and of the prophets with the cornerstone. Remember, we just studied the cornerstone. So we've got the prophets telling us this was what was coming, the cornerstone being Yeshua, the Messiah himself. And in Ephesians, he, this is Shaul Paul's words, that the cornerstone is Yeshua. Last time in Passover, I told you how we saw Kepha, how we saw others that, that showed us from Yeshia, from Isaiah, Kepha being Peter, that the cornerstone was all a picture of Yeshua. We put that all together, but here is another proof point where it's spelled out and doesn't give any room for anyone to come up with any other decision of what it could be. We're built on that foundation with the cornerstone being Yeshua himself. And verse 21 says, In union with him, the whole building is held together. It is growing into a holy temple in union with the Lord. Uh, let me read the next verse also. Yes, in union with him, you yourselves are being built together into a spiritual dwelling place for God or into a dwelling of God in the spirit, in the ruch, depending on uh, whether you're looking at the complete Jewish Bible or your English one. The idea that we're getting is that we are being built as a, a house, but the difference now is it's living stones. It's not stones that are cold and, and harsh and the temple that Yeshua pointed to when he walked on this earth and said it would be destroyed, and we know that it was, but this is talking about Yeshua being the cornerstone. We're built into his house. We come in through the spirit. We're one in union, resting on that cornerstone, and that this is the, the, the foundation that was laid for us, given to us by the apostles, by those like Shaul Paul and Kepha, Peter, and, and uh, Yaakov, James, and others in our new covenant, but the foundation principles given to us by our prophets, Ezekiel, Daniel, Yeshaya, and, and many, many others. I mentioned uh, Daniel, Isaiah, and I don't remember the first one I said, uh, Ezekiel. 
but we're seeing a beautiful building that we are a part of so when you see this you can picture yourself as part of this building each of the boards had two sockets in it and two in scripture gives us the idea of witness and testimony by two or three witnesses let a thing be established and we know that if you have two witnesses in a court of law it stands strong much stronger than when you have just a single witness it is a good and strong testimony the uh, boards were set in silver sockets silver speaking to us of the redemption and the silver also separated the boards from the earth and we know that redemption separates us uh, believers from the world the world being representative of the sin so we see the picture being separated and to God once again through the redemption that Messiah Yeshua bought for us with his blood on the sides were and it's hard to see in this picture I've looked for better pictures to show it if I find some I'll add them into my PowerPoint in the future but there are five boards on each side that are, hold it together five is a number of grace in scripture it's interesting that four bars are, uh, you can see them but the fifth the center was never seen as if the one holding the glue together in the middle is the unseen one and that makes us think of the Ruch HaKodesh we never see him but we know he's the glue that holds us together and even unites us as one in this special body this special house that's being built with Yeshua as that cornerstone now if you look at the picture I have up here you see the doorway the doorway again is a curtain and this is our second entrance remember Yochanan we drew on that I am the way the second part is I am the truth and we see that the way into the truth is witness to us the testimony of truth is given to us uh, we also know that we're told to worship in truth and we can't do that until after we have that salvation Yochanan John chapter 4 verse 24 says God Elohim is spirit Ruch, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth we come into the truth he is the truth when you are one in Yeshua the spirit is within you and then as you worship you come together and worship in that spirit and in truth now going into the Holy of Holies and a further in in the future at a future point in time uh, was only for the priests <clears throat> but that didn't leave us out now because as Kepha told us in his uh, first letter that he wrote chapter 2 and verse 9 he referring to those who are believers like him said but you are a chosen people the king's Kohanim the king's priests a holy nation a people for God to possess why in order for you to declare the praises of the one who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light remember the priest was to show God to the people and represent people to God and we see that that is what is meant by being the priest that now it's no longer just the Levitical priesthood but through the the um, line of Yeshua who was our great high priest we are all made priests we are all that chosen people to be representing him to the world Elohim has made us a royal priesthood God's own possession and we are told that in Revelation when we're looking to um, a later time looking at a heavenly scene we see that there was a group of people that sang a new song this is chapter 5 of Revelation verses 9 and 10 worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals for you were slain purchased for God with your blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation so obviously the praise was going to Yeshua the Lamb of God who was slain who purchased by his blood men remember north east west and south the good news for all mankind any who would come to him verse 10 tells us you made them into a kingdom for God to rule Kohanim priests to serve him and they will rule over the earth and that's the future that we will see is ruling and reigning with Messiah our Savior the hangings for the gate are the same as before that we saw they are um, silver sockets but the five pillars that held up the curtain and again five being the number of grace uh, four was how many there were coming in uh, to the courtyard from the outside four being the number for earth and where man comes in now we are seeing by grace we go into this building by grace we enter through the way into the truth into his fellowship and presence and that's why uh, we have told us again in the book of Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 16 
Therefore, let us confidently approach the throne from which God gives grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. What a blessing to know we can always go to that altar. We can go right into the Holy of Holies. We can go right into the presence of our God on the basis of this shed blood going through the way and the truth and receive that grace that we are seeing, number five, in the mercy that we need. Grace is receiving what we don't deserve and mercy is not getting what we do deserve. So it may be the flip side of a coin, but both very, very important. At the very top of the, the hangings, the, the, you know, the sockets were silver, but the very top, the caps, were made of gold. And that, again, speaking of deity, reminds us that Yeshua was crowned with glory and with honor. And this is where I see uh, Thomas's first song uh, that he sang for us, or we were to be singing with him. So perfect for tonight because it talked about the Lord being made a little lower for a time, made in the image of man for a time, but that God lifted him up. In Hebrews chapter 2, verses 5 through 9, we read, and this is the verses that I'll be closing with for tonight. For he did not subject to angels the world to come, the Olam Haba, concerning which we are speaking, but one is testified here saying, What is man that you remember him? Can you hear Thomas singing? Or the son of man that you are concerned about him? You have made him a little lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor and have appointed him over the works of your hands. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. We see the whole picture there. What are we that God is mindful of us that Messiah would leave heaven, leave his throne, leave the royalty, leave the deity. Well, he didn't leave the deity, but leave the, the, the glory to come and be made a little lower than the angels, to be made in human form, subjected to being in one spot at a time, to not be able to be everywhere at once as he was in his freedom beforehand. And that we see him not left in that low position. It was in that low position in his humility that he died, but then he was resurrected in the glory and the power of our holy God, raised up greater than, brought him back up into that highness that is in the presence of heaven where he sits at the right hand of God, waiting for all the enemies to be made in subjection under his feet. But we know that God has put all things under his feet and appointed him over and notices over the works of your hands. Not only did he create it, but he has rule and control over it. For in subjecting all things to him, he left nothing that is not subject to him. But now we don't see that all things are subjected to him. We see the sin and the evil of this world. But, verse 9, we do see him who was made for a little while lower than the angels, namely Yeshua, because of the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. Remember, it's the picture of the cross, and this sums it all up, that he came to suffer that death, that we might come through the picture of the cross into the very presence, the very grace of God to receive help in time of need. What a wonderful and beautiful picture, and we are only part way through, but what a great place to stop, and what an ideal place to ponder, to think, to allow your mind, as we live in a day where so many are filled with so much fear, the virus that cannot be seen, that's stealing the peace from men's hearts, that is shaking this world, that has upset the economy, has upset the, um, the physical well-being of so many, and it causing so much fear. I have no idea where you are. All I know is that there is one who gives us complete and total shalom. Shalom, shalom means perfect peace. Yeshua, Isaiah 26, 3 tells us, He will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusts in thee. When we put our trust in the Lord, then we have that perfect peace and we can face a virus we cannot see. We can face whatever is the obstacle, whatever is coming at you, you can face through the love of Yeshua, through the grace that you can plead for at any time, going right into that throne room and asking the Lord, give me the grace I need, give me that mercy that I need. And the Lord is faithful to meet us in that. It's such a beautiful picture. And when we focus on Yeshua, when we keep our eyes on Him, 
The things of this world do grow strangely dim. They will not steal the, the peace from you. The lack of peace is the lack of love. And when you are in the presence of his love, when you are being bathed in his grace, when you come into that Shekhinah glory, there is a calm, there is a peace, there is a shalom that this world does not know, but Yeshua came to obtain for us. I think it's a great place to stop and to enter into a time of praise and prayer. We can bring our requests anytime to the Lord and know that he always hears us and know that he's always answering. Does it mean he always does things our way? Of course not. I wouldn't want a God that's on my level. I'm glad I've got one that, that's far beyond me. And I submit myself to whatever way he knows is best, whether I can understand it or not. I just know that it, he is working all things together for my good, for our good, and that nothing can separate us from the love of God.